ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, guests, and our online friends, uh, thank you for making this time to join us. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this dialogue on the Kampepe Report um, at Stellenbosch Business School. While some might consider the report timely and an affirmation of their lived experiences, some have viewed it as merely stating the obvious, and for others, a means for further justifying divisions amongst ourselves. Whichever perspective you may adopt, what is most important and apparent about this report is that it provides a more public display of the state of transformation at Stellenbosch University. For those who have not engaged with the report, it was commissioned as a result of two incidents of racism that was alleged in May 2022. Stemming from these incidents and the historical challenges of transformation at Stellenbosch University, the mandate provided to the Honorable Justice Sisi Kampepe included a deeper interrogation of the state of transformation at Stellenbosch University as a whole. and corrupted a study of chronic dysfunction in South African universities. Dr. Busi Siwe Raputing is by profession a medical profession, a, a practitioner, um, but also a graduate of the Medical School of Stellenbosch and currently uh, enrolled with our Masters in Business Administration. And to my immediate left is Professor Mark Smith, the director of the business school. Um, I think, Mark, you've been with us for about two years, is it close to two years. Uh, but more importantly, Mark also heads up the transformation committee of the business school. I also want to welcome some of our student representatives who've made the effort and the time uh, to be here in person. Uh, so thank you for joining us and to our other colleagues um, on the floor. I'm Dr. Arman Bam. Your host for the afternoon, and I will be facilitating the session unpacking the Kampepe report. As an indication of the proceedings today, we will first call on Professor Jansen to deliver his address. And once he's done that, I will lead to my colleagues to my left here to give their response um, and engage in a dialogue with Prof. Jansen. Please feel free if you're online and in the room. The opportunity will pre be presented to you to engage with the panelists. Um, and the idea is for us to further the aspect of transformation through this dialogue. So, Professor Jansen, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, I reached out to the business school because of a complaint that I have about our beloved institution. And that is that it is not really an intellectual community. You know, bombs could go off all the, over the place and people still continue as if nothing happened. And, uh, but I also reached out to the business school because they have a very, very slick, um, you know, organizational apparatus. You have very good marketing people, very good systems, as you can see. We've probably been double checked for voice 17 times, you know. Um, but they're very professional and they do a great job and, and so on. I also felt that it was important to have this discussion, not just for the students on the Kayamandi campus, <laughs> sorry, main campus, but, but also to have that with the students of the business school. And indeed, they should have the same discussion at the military academy and all the campuses of the university. So this is a particular kind of audience, obviously, it's less undergraduate, more postgrads and so on. And, and the report provides an opportunity to think deeply about what we think we're doing and how we might go forward. So, uh, as you all know, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, the retired judge, uh, Sisi Kampepe, released a 184-page report uh, on allegations of racism at Stellenbosch University. Now, we can debate, of course, 
why a judge and not, for example, organizational change specialists familiar with higher education environments was appointed. But it does seem that South African society defaults uh, to the belief that judges can offer objective and independent uh, accounts of a crisis compared to, to other professionals. I'm not really sure uh, that that is the case. Uh, maybe <laughs> in this vein, the problems are bigger at UCT because I see they now have three retired judges leading the investigation of the vice chancellor and the chair of council, judges and party, Kachalia, and of course, Kampepe. Now, it's important to note that the commission of inquiry at SU was called for by the university management. And the report makes three major points, many points, but let me just lift out three for the sake of time. One is that black students and staff still feel unwelcome at the university. Two, that while the university, the university has made, quote, impressive theoretical strides, I have no idea what that means, but that's in the report, impressive theoretical strides on transformation, such efforts were not felt in the lived experiences of staff and students. And three, that the university should review its multilingual language policy to, quote, remove the possibility of language exclusion through the preference of Afrikaans. Now, I had the privilege of, of being called as an expert witness, as you might see in the report, by Judge Kampepe, an uh, absolutely amazing human being, quite apart from the fact that she is the jurist who gave us the most profound statement on why Jacob Zuma should go to prison, which in a nutshell made the point if we don't, then the rest of the public won't believe that we're serious with this most important institution called the courts. So within her character as a, as, a, as a great jurist and wonderful human being, she writes with a soft hand and with considerable wisdom, careful to recognize the rights of all South Africans, including white Afrikaans speakers. Somehow the DA's local agitator missed that point. Its closing arguments for change are not only structural, but also surprisingly personal, making the point that rebuilding a campus in a country is impossible, quote, unless every individual is willing to look inwards and change, end of quote. So why has this report agitated the white right? But more importantly, what explains these very public displays of racism? So I thought about this for a very long time. And, and let me give you the background. In 2018, the Minister of Education at the time uh, put together an investigative committee uh, that released the so the so-called Saudin report, named after its chair, Professor Crane Saudin. And that was a report on transformation, social cohesion, and discrimination in public universities. That report is available online if anyone was interested. So I compared that report last night to the report of Judge Kampepe. Now that report was commissioned following the very serious rates incident, the name of the male residents at the University of the Free State, where four white male students, you might recall, racially abused five black cleaners on the Bloemfontein campus. Now, the obvious question is, why was there a need for a Kampepe report led by a judge when the same ground was covered 14 years back by the Saudi report led by mainly academics? Now, the reason, this might surprise you, but stay in the room, the reason you have this latter-day performance of racism at Stellenbosch University is precisely because the university is changing, not because it is untransformed. Now, I've got first-hand experience of that. The more you push transformation as a university leader or leadership, the more the pushback becomes quite dramatic. Ask yourself this question in that context. Why would both the Free State students and the now three incidents uh, at Stellenbosch involve white men and urine? Quite simple, actually. Just like dogs use urine 
to mark their territory and anxiety, white male students use the same strategy to protest black incursion into their intimate spaces, such as residences. Stellenbosch now has more black students than ever before in its 100-year history and more black academics, including professors, than a mere decade ago. Just to give you an indication of numbers, in 1994, Stellenbosch University had 90% white students and 10% black students. Today, 2022, it has about 50-50. In other words, 50% black students, 50% white students. But if you look at the trend over the past three, four, five, six years, within the next five years, this will be a majority black campus as far as student enrollments are concerned. Why? Because the white student enrollment has plateaued at 14,000 plus minus, it's just stayed the same. But the black student numbers have obviously increased. So as I said this morning in the context of a, a, a main campus seminar, um, the, that Stellenbosch in terms of student enrollment becomes an emphatically black campus of the next decade is not something surprising, it's not something you have to fight for, it's just gonna happen. Secondly, that Stellenbosch would over time, more slowly than the students, but that's true everywhere, also become a emphatically black campus as far as academic appointments is concerned. That also is going to happen. And it happens uh, 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 by race much more quickly than it would for women, and in particular for women in the bench sciences, your chemists, your, your, your engineers, and so on. And the reason for that is we have very good data globally that women, as they grow older, leave the academic profession in their 40s and 50s. Men stay on, and there are very complex sociological reasons for that, um, etc. Now, how fast you transform the professoriate, of course, that is dependent on us, uh, on leadership in the university. As uh, uh, Barack Obama likes to quote, and quoting Martin Luther King Jr., he's <laughs> It's, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says, the arc of the universe bends towards uh, justice. Barack Obama adds, but it doesn't bend by itself. <laughs> In other words, it, it depends on what the university, each university does. Um, and that is why you find this resentment both in the schools, and I, with Samantha Krieger, we've done studies to demonstrate how this works, but also within uh, uh, you know, universities. So, um, <clears throat> rates happened at the, the this is our Ace Marie and the Free State. Rates happened when black student enrollments were escalating at the University of the Free State and the racially integrated residences was on the agenda. This was before my time. I was asked to come in after this incident. And that is exactly the point at which Stellenbosch University is now. That's why you're seeing all these incidents. Um, at the time when Free State was transforming at pace and with great chaos, Stellenbosch was still emphatically a white university in everything, even student in the Romans. Now that time has come, as I said to Professor Van de Villiers when he was first appointed, your trouble is still ahead of you. Because at that point, it was very clear five years ago, that this university was well settled <laughs> as a white campus, uh, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and so Stellenbosch is now facing the stopping point, as we call it in the literature on schools, when the number of black students reach a certain point. Uh, white students tend to leave. Now, that hasn't happened yet at Stellenbosch because white students everywhere else is coming here as they flee um, growing black enrollments in places like Durban and elsewhere. Um, and then, of course, this first urine incident with Jens de Toy at Ace Maria prompted the Compepe inquiry. The question is, what will the Stellenbosch University leadership do in response to the Compepe report? I want to suggest that it should, to begin with, continue to ignore the apoplectic few on the white right 
which if you don't read the Bild and the Berger and the Sunday, the, the report as a black person, it goes, or a white English person, goes completely, you're completely unaware of this French warfare <coughs> happening and the white Afrikaans right in, Stal in and around Stalingrad. It is, it gets hectic. Uh, it gets quite hectic. <clears throat> I generally don't read that stuff because it just sickens me, but I read it when there's a crisis because I need to understand what our other uh, campus citizens are saying. Now, the big issue for the white right is the threat that they perceive to Afrikaans. But you've got to remember, somebody who's been in this debate for years and especially have some marks on my back from the Free State, you must remember for these people it is not about Afrikaans as a language. It is about white identity and cultural preservation. If you don't understand that, you don't understand what this debate is about and therefore you can't change it. They just cannot imagine a world in which Afrikaans is simply another language in a richly multilingual world. Put differently, the Tal Sreders, Sreders, the fighters for Afrikaans, do not know how to be without being dominant. And Afrikaans is one of the few remaining weapons in their arsenal to fight a war already lost. By the way, there's a very powerful parallel in Trump's America. A lot of that performance that you see, the racism, uh, the resistance to change, is because of the demographic shifts in the United States in which you no longer can assume that this is a place that is white, evangelical, Christian, uh, uh, and so on. It never was, by the way. But in that imagined past, it becomes the lightning rod for things like the January 6 attack on the Capitol building, and they attempt to overthrow the elections. It's very much the same, except that year white people are a minority, and therefore cannot mobilize at that level anymore. The second thing I want to suggest as I conclude is that the university needs, needs to make uh, quick and firm decisions on the transformation of the residences. For white African students everywhere, from Turkey's to here, the residence is not simply a place to stay. It is a place to remember. It is a place where your parents, your grandparents and others tell you stories all the time about what it was like in Ace Marais uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. It is a very deep, it took me a while to understand the deep emotional connection to a res. You go to UCT or these English universities, the res is a place just to, to sleep and eat and study and get through. It doesn't have obviously the same uh, resonances and so on. One aspect of the residences, whether it was Rates or uh, Malays, J.B. Malharaba in the Free State, <clears throat> which caused us a lot of damage, um, and Hayes Marais, is, is a very clear leadership problem in some of them, and white resistance in many of them. And if you don't deal with that problem, people continue to feel <clears throat> that they can piss up the place and mark their territory and humiliate black people and get away with it. Now my experience is, and this is something that I've lived through, is that there are many progressive white staff and students who can, alongside their black counterparts, completely rewire the social and cultural ethos of the residences so that the alienation many black students and staff reported can be overcome. Why is this important? Because this country and this province has a tradition of white and black working together to change the country. I don't need to remind you of the history of the UDF in Cape Town. I don't need to remind you of every, which is why what I see at UCT is so incredibly bizarre. It's clearly people who don't understand the history of the province, but in this province, whether you were in the unity movement, whether you were in the Pan-African Congress, whether you were in the ANC, whether you were in the Communist Party, there is a tradition of working with white and black across the board to change the country. That has to be the strategy. But there's another self-interested strategy for black and white to work together in Stellenbosch, and that is that the white staff know where the bodies are buried. 
no doubt there will be a price to pay. Stellenbosch is by far the wealthiest public university on the African continent. Let me just say this uh, alongside the distinguished director of the business school, because I'm sure he hears this from his uh, seniors. If Stellenbosch University says they don't have money, they're lying. <laughs> they're lying. There are unbelievable numbers of people who give millions to this university every single year, quite apart from the money that was taken off campus at the point of democracy, but that's another scandal we can talk about at some other time. The older residences at the former Afrikaans universities are endowed with deep meaning, as I said, and commitment for alum. So you fool yourself if you think that Professor Wim, and I believe he's a good leader, I believe his heart is in the right place, but you fool yourself if you think he can simply change a residence without severe backlash, both financial and political. I've walked that path, and yet this has to be done to create over the long term more welcoming and affirming environment for both white and black staff and for both white and black students. We always think of transformation as only benefiting black people. Actually, it also benefits white people to bring you out of modes of thinking that has shaped this university for over a century. Finally, <clears throat> the university has to accelerate the appointment of the most talented black academics across its faculties and campuses so that all students, black and white, are exposed to scholars and scientists from around the country and around the world. And let me just say this to you as South Africans in particular, that has to include the top scholars and scientists from other African countries. If you are an academic xenophobe, I don't have anything to say to you. But no university became great in the world by having a nativist policy in its appointments. I don't even want to make political arguments. And by the way, I find it absolutely bizarre that some of the people I have to fight with who headed up the decolonization protests are the same people who respect the colonial borders around them. I don't get it. Maybe it's because I did math lit. I didn't. <laughs> the transformation of the professoriate would go a long way to deeply transforming an otherwise settled campus. Thanks, Arman. Thank you, Prof. Jackson. Uh, thank you very much for your, your insights there. I think I'm going to, to just swing to, to my left here. Um, there's a couple of points I'll come back to you on, on Jonathan, in, in terms of uh, aspects of leadership. But, Rusi, like, I was, in those times, a, a student. I was sharing with Lucy before. I was one of six black uh, students uh, when I first came to Stellenbosch amongst a hundred. Um, that aspect of language was, was a real barrier uh, and a challenge for some of my colleagues. Um, and, and that was an uncomfortable experience many years ago. Um, how much of that has changed, do you see? Uh, so we've got the backdrop of this compared to the report. Um, you, you've heard of Jonathan's experience at the Free State, he, he's, he's views into this report. Um, how much of that has actually changed from a student perspective? I think I first want to start with the reason why I'm here. I think probably not everybody in the room or online understands why I've been selected to sit here with the panel. So first of all, I graduated from University of Stellenbosch with an MBCHB and I spent six years on Tigerberg campus. That was between 2007 and 2012. When I left that campus, I was very angry I wasn't the calm individual that you see here today. And it is a blessing that you called me here today at this point in time, when I've been able to heal from the wounds that I had from being an undergraduate student at the university. I'm currently studying at the business school. So what I experienced at Tigerberg campus and main campus is different from the business school and the two environments have always been different, even back then. So let me begin with the main campus. When I started there, I had white friends growing up. I went to an international school. 
I did French as a second language. And in the corridors of our school, we weren't allowed to have conversations in our home language. I speak Sesotho, but my father is Zulu. But it was a strict rule at school. We had to respect the fact that there is a universal language and we were taught ways of accommodating other people from different tribes, different areas of the world. It was just that kind of upbringing that I had. So I applied to study at the University of Stellenbosch and I was accepted. When I walked in, I went in with that mentality. That's what I understood, that's what I was taught. And I quickly realized that I'm actually different. I was quickly brought to the, I don't wanna say reality because reality means that I agree that it's true, but I was brought into the illusion that I'm inadequate, I'm incompetent, and my cognitive function is substandard compared to that of my white colleagues. And that was a shock. When I went in, I was told we would have the lectures in one language and there would be an option for translation. I made double show because I don't speak Afrikaans. That's what we were told. So we went in and that was not the reality. I spent hours and hours trying to catch up on material we were taught during the day because we were taught in Afrikaans. My black colleagues and I were now academically impaired, not because we had any inherent cognitive disability, but we were impaired because of the system that chose to prefer one language and one tribe over the other. So there I was, a top student, with other black top students, and that changed, that reality changed. We were angry, but we were stuck because you can imagine by the time you realize that you've been told something and now you're in second year, you can't go start medicine somewhere else. So you just have to continue. So this is my introduction and this is who I am. I'm not that angry black girl because I found the Lord and I learned to forgive, to love. And I quote Genesis 127, that male and female, we were all created in the image of God. And that's my understanding. That's my story. That's God's story and I'm sticking to it. So I'm brown because I have melanin and you're white, but we're actually the same. So I'm not here to sow seeds of division. I'm here because we need solutions. I'm here because we need to assist the leadership of the university to practicalize that with which they have done theoretically. Because the truth of the matter is, the transformation apparatus and tools and all of that big academic English looks really good on paper. But it is evident that it has not translated into the physical realm. And that is why we still have incidents like the Hayes Murray incident. Have I answered your question? Uh, I really appreciate, Lucy, the fact that you, you, you speak about healing uh, and this opportunity to have reflected through this experience and this notion, I think, that this is our university. And we're here, along with our colleagues, along with the students, to bring about that change. As Jonathan pointed out, there is pushback. Uh, uh, Jonathan alluded to the leadership and the challenges that they have. To the notion of leadership, Mark, and I might put you on the spot here and Jonathan at the same time. Um, you, you know, we can say that the leadership now receives this report, they consider it a tipping point. But as you pointed out, not too long ago, we had a couple of other incidents. And so the question for me is around, are the black voices being heard? Why, and you ask the question, why does it take a report like this to make people sit up and think about change? What's, what's missing in the system to acknowledge the hurt, the pain, and the possible solutions that are being offered um, from a leadership perspective? 
you're sitting in a difficult position, Mark. Um, uh, I ask you this question. I work in the space. Bruce has been very, uh, I don't know if it's diplomatic, um, to say that the, the business school experience is different. Um, but I want to push you on that. Is it really different? And what makes it different? Thanks, Alan. Um, I just, like Lucy, I just get, I just say one bit about my background and what brings me here, because I think it's important to understand. Uh, we've probably hit my accent, and I'm not a South African. I've only I arrived in South Africa physically a year ago, and online two years ago. So I'm a novice African. I'm a very proud to be here. I'm very honoured that I was chosen to work, with, to, to select to work at Stellenbosch University. It's a great honour and a privilege to work with 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 with, with, uh, with great colleagues. So, Black and white, and on, in, on this campus, on other campus, on other campuses, it's it's a, it's a, it's a great privilege. Doesn't mean I'm, and that also doesn't mean I'm here to talk for the institution. I can talk for the business school because that's where that's where I work, but I don't talk for, for the institution. But I think this question around leadership is 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 really interesting. If you read, if you read Campepe, the one of the observations on I think really right right at the top is about how uh, the the leadership in the in the in the, in the university relies heavily on hierarchy rather than relying, relying on, on, on the responsibilities that come with leadership. And I think that's, that, that, for, that, for me, that's quite an interesting point because we say, well, well, then that leads us to thinking about, well, who is responsible for that leadership, but also what comes with, with leadership where, where, wherever you are. And I, I was thinking about this and thinking, well, you might expect somebody from business school to come with, you know, people, somebody with a hammer comes with, come, thinks everything is a nail. And somebody, somebody from business school will think everything is a leadership problem. But, but I, it was, it was the, the judge that put, pointed this out. And I think this, this idea that there's certain responsibilities that come with, with leadership, and it's not just the position that you're in. And number two, that, that, it's, that, it's, that it's, everybody's, it's everybody's, it's everybody's part of that leadership problem. But that leads me to think also that it's actually a management problem. Not management. I'm not blaming any colleagues. It's just like a management challenge. It could be a case. This could be a case study in another in another university, another another business school. So you might look. You might look at this uh, this cultural change issue, this uh, this issue of uh, the history and the, tra the trajectory of the organisation, and say, well, how might how might we uh, how might we deal with that? So that's not to be dispassionate about it and, and to ignore the pain and trauma that other people people have experienced. But actually, it is a it is a, it's a it's a management challenge, and for that reason, that gives me a sense of hope that we can do do something about it, because we have other management challenges in our day in our day jobs, wherever where you're working in a university or another organ and whatever organisation. If you have poor service, if you have electricity that doesn't work, you fix it. Managers come along and fix it. So if we have a problem of of, 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 uh, of microaggressions and people feeling unwelcome and and, and uh, historic trauma and lack and and lack of cultural change, then it's something that we can we, we can we can perhaps to, perhaps uh, address. So, coming back to the particular question about m missing voices, I think that's where those leaders have to stand up and create create those spaces. And that involves the other part of leadership, which I think is courage. Actually, leadership is kind of a lonely job, so quite a lot of the time. You also also rely relies on courage. And I think courage means that you need to know, feel that somebody's got your back. So I'm going to stick my neck out and, and say something, and, and, and I'm okay, whether it's me or whether it's somebody who works in the business school or, 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 or somewhere else. And in that sense, if I, if, if, if I then create a space, or we create a space, in, in this case, in the business school to talk about this, then we, we're, we're able to start to open that, that space, and then people perhaps have a little bit of trust in us that we're going to create that, that safe space. Now I don't think that's going to that doesn't come out that doesn't come overnight. That takes a lot of time. That trust because there's many many as, as the report shows many many years of uh, of, 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 of of mistrust and of trauma and, and, and of hurt that people experience. So our, our, our man is a is, is and, and well, both, my, both our man and Busi either side of me are very young students. One of the people on our advisory board at the business school was the first black student ever at, at Stellenbosch on his own. He's now eighty something. Okay, so the, so the, we 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 the, that vo those voices have been hidden for for a very long time, and that that pain and trauma goes back a long time. So we're not going to change it overnight. And the, an English guy who just arrived is not going to change it overnight for this even for this space. But but if we have a bit of courage, if the leaders have a bit of courage, and each leader has a bit of courage to make space for those voices, then we can. Then I think that's when we start to to open that up. 
But then I also think if I can ask the second part of the question, or the second part of the, that voice question for me, is that they should also be voices put, put upwards. I don't underestimate the challenges that my peers and my, my, my seniors have in, in the uh, superiors in the rest of the university. It's, it's, an enor it's an enormous challenge. And I agree 100% what Jonathan said about that if you're creating resistance and if people are starting to get uh, a bit edgy about, about, the, about the topic, then somebody's promoting change and something is happening. And I think that's, so that is a, so that's a, a kind of a good sign. But that means we need to all be courageous. We need to support those people, uh, people like me need to support our uh, peers, my peers who are also uh, creating space for voices, creating space for change, but also rely on them to, have, to, have to, to support me and, uh, and other leaders as well to promote that change. Thanks, Mark. Jonathan, you mentioned Afrikaans and there's this um, particular feelings around identity. Uh, I want to read, uh, and, you, and you mentioned politicians, and I think there are some politicians that use these opportunities to sow further division. And I just want to quote, I won't mention who it is, but this is the quote, and I'd like you to respond to that in relation to what you shared with us earlier in the report. In the Vashatayt Stalinbosch say an effect that the help van het Jan Marie Fons and other African skankers nie so taal nie meer welkom is nie. Is dit tyd om die geldkrane toe te draai? Kan daar die helpbronne beter gebruik word vir a private Kaapse Afrikaanse universiteit? And that's in my maybe my, my better Afrikaans that I had to practice. I know it's not a useful comment, but that seems to be a strong sentiment that comes through. How is it that we address people like this? Uh, and you speak about the pushback, and you speak about having to deal with funds that support this university. And historically, we understand that that, um, that funds do come um, largely from our white uh, alumni. What is your, your take on a, on a view like that? Yeah. Um. You know, when I hear stuff like that, it makes my blood boil. Um, and I suppose five years ago, ten years ago, I would have used two words on this platform to describe these imbeciles. Um, the thing to do with that kind of racism is to ignore it. So I have nothing to say to those people. There's nothing you can do to change them. They believe that this public university should be a private university for Afrikaners. That's how they think. So don't let that get to you. Um, ignore it because there's nothing they can do. But the threat is familiar. The threat comes in two ways. And again, I've experienced that at the Free State. The threat comes, we're going to take our money away. Now, the Free State, there was nothing to take away because we had the poor Buddha, you know, uh, 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 and <laughs> yeah, you guys are very rich, uh, Buddha. So, um, and I don't use the word disparagingly, I mean farmers, uh, literally. So there, Free State, it was the poor white university, remember that, compared to Turkey's and Stellenbosch. Um, yeah, they have money. But ask yourself, how the hell was that money accumulated? Do you really think this is white money? Do these people think this is white money? Do they know how that Jan Yetmere fund was, was, was founded? And that's the duplicity. That's the dishonesty. So I wouldn't worry about that because they actually, I know the people on that fund. There is no way they will do that. But the threat is a familiar one. But the threat has another part to it, as I've discovered at the Free State. Every day, somebody would tell me, if you guys move to in Afrikaans, if you move to Faso Transformation, we're sending our kids to, to Poch, you know? And I remember, <laughs> because Poch was sort of the university where you could go and still be white, to this day, by the way. Um, just on a lighter note, because I, I don't want to make you all depressed, uh, Johan van Seyl, who hired me at the University of Pretoria, the Sundam guy, um, he invited me to speak at Sundam, and there was hundreds of, of these finance people and so on and so forth. And so, in the course of the reporting to them on, in this talk uh, at the convention center, I said, my biggest concern that I have to deal with at the Free State these days is interracial love affairs. You know, as black and white students were getting married, were loving each other, and so on. And we worked very hard to get to a point where they just 
were normal, you know. And as I said it, there were these, this table, it was on a platform at the center. There was this table of young white Afrikaans guys. And I, I, <laughs> I have to present this in Afrikaans and then I'll translate. But as I'm saying, my biggest problem at the University of the Free State is interracial love affair. <laughs> One white guy says to the other, you fuck, Steve, I can watch too. <laughs> Damn it, I'm sending my child to watch you know. Um, so we'll send our child elsewhere, uh, elsewhere and we'll take the money out of the university. You don't have to worry about that at Sarabash at the moment because there's enough people that appreciate the strength of the business school, the amazing progress in big data, the transformation happening in the science track. People love seeing a university that improves the ranking. Now we can have a debate on the rankings because I think that's a fairly dubious thing. But for the average parent and student, Stellenbosch jumping in the rankings every single year, including in education, the business school, and so on, that attracts people to a university. So you can convince conservative people by the quality of your degree, even if they might be dismayed by the quality, by the speed of the transformation. But let me just say this, uh, uh, because I was sitting here quite emotional, as, as and unfortunately, you, re you read that thing after I listened to Busi. Um, I can't tell you how distressed I was, not because I heard it for the first time, but because Busi put it so eloquently and without any rancor. And this university owes an apology to people, a heartfelt apology, not a strategic apology, uh, apology, but a heartfelt apology for what she and hundreds of others, thousands of others went through as the first, the first people who came in when the language policy was still emphatically up to that. Uh, and we can't just let that go. And I'm glad you met Jesus, and I'm glad you. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, and I'm glad that you're healing, don't get me wrong. But I really, I'm going to talk to problem about this actually. I won't mention your name, but I will say to him, listen, man, uh, go around this, the campuses, talk to the graduates, call alumni together, especially black alumni, but also white alumni, and say, we owe you guys an apology for the shit you had to go through when all you wanted was to get a degree and change the lives of your family and the lives of the country. I just don't think that can be said, and we move on in the discussion. But that's something I will take with me. Thanks, John. Lucy, just um, before we go and we open up for some questions, in the Kampepe report, and Jonathan is intimately connected to um, the introduction of an, uh, an undergraduate course that exposes students to a, a different way of thinking. Um, just your take, you know, and, and, and I know you're in the phase of postgraduate studies and maybe reflecting on your past experiences as a, a younger student, um, uh, and then again today. Just your thoughts on, uh, is it um, a meaningful way to bring about change, and do you think it's going to work? So I'm going to answer the question in a medical way, because that's the language that I speak. So this is the problem that we have. And I say we as future leadership of the university, and I say we as a citizen of South Africa. At the University of Stellenbosch, we are dealing with a scenario where there's a doctor and there's a patient. Okay. The judge has examined the situation that is the patient who is very sick. She was sent to examine the chest and to auscultate the lungs. As she was listening to the breath sounds, she found that there was, a, there was an abnormal heart sound. She put the two together and found that the patient has heart failure, which has caused fluid to build up in the lungs, and thus the patient has cardiac failure and pulmonary edema. So she's come out to give the diagnosis and to say, yes, I know you sent me on this mission because of Hayes Marie and racism, and this is what I found with the heart. But when she started making other recommendations, we started getting uncomfortable when she spoke about the language and the culture and the heritage and the foundations. You cannot treat heart failure without attending to the fluid buildup in the lungs. 
That is the problem that the university has been sitting with for the longest time. What I'm trying to say is, we are all products of our upbringing. We were raised in a certain way. We were taught what is right and what is wrong. It is my impression and my strong belief that to take a group of first year students and attempt to educate them in a short module about how to engage with other races and then have them move on to actually study what they went to university to do would not be accomplishing the intention to sort out the diagnosis. That would be simply masking the symptoms temporarily up until the patient presents again in second year and that disease is far worse. The problem is the foundation. The problem of the University of Stellenbosch is the foundation. Because my Afrikaans brethren, brothers and sisters whom I love, feel as though it is their university, it is their territory, it is their space and their language. That has come out strongly and the university has entertained it because they still preserve the right for students to be educated in Afrikaans. So on one end, the leadership of the university has one foot on the other side of transformation and publishing all of these wonderful transformation policies. But in the other end, they still have to appease those who are financing the university and they still have to appease those who want to preserve the Africana heritage. That is not going to work. A leader must never sit on the fence. It is dangerous to be lukewarm. The leadership of the university has to make a decision, a tough decision. We cannot be tipping every year. These discussions shouldn't be taking place year after year. Have I answered your question? I think more than just answered my question, that analogy is such an apt way of describing um, what it is that, uh, that we encounter in the university. My, my son would have said that's the mic drop moment <laughs> right there. <laughs> right. But I think for, that's just made it, I think, for a lot of us listening, you know, a whole lot easier to get to grips uh, with what it is that we face. Mark, the, the last question before I, I, I move on here. Uh, I say this with, with, with affection. Uh, as an outsider coming in, the notion of policies, um, and in the report, you see the disjointed functioning of departments um, and, and policies not really delivering on what, what, what they should be delivering on. Um, so a little bit on the spot here. Mm -hmm. What has your experience been in terms of what uh, Judge Kampepe raises here, um, in encountering that, and then what do you suggest, you know, as a way forward in terms of um, realignment? If that's uh, a good enough word, um, what are your what is your experience as somebody coming into a leadership position, trying to engage with these policies, different units? Uh, what's that been for you? Um, thanks, uh, Thank you, yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> and also, I have to go to Busy's mic drop moment. She's, you know, I feel, feel I'm not going to live up to it. But um, I think so I'm clearly a, a, a white man, but I'm not a, I'm, I, I am also a foreigner. I'm an alien. And my experience of Stellenbosch University when I first arrived was, was of the, of an interesting and warm place of individuals, but also a place that's <laughs> deeply complex to understand. And, uh, and that, for me, that that actually manifested itself in that I went for an important meeting in Stellenbosch on my first day. I couldn't get parking. I got lost. There's no road signs. There's, there, there, it's almost designed not to help the, the alien um, and, and in physically. Okay. And, 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 I, and I come with all the privileges that, you know, that, should, that, that, you, that you, might, you might expect. I think that's, that is, that you can get under that. And, I, and, now, I feel, and, now, and I, now I know how to get around the town and I can get, I can get to my parking place and et cetera. But there is a complexity to the to the organisation which looks tends to look a little bit inward and not 
be thinking about the person coming from outside, and whether that's a whether that's a foreigner who's just visiting, whether that's a, whether that's somebody who's an, an expatriate who's coming from another country, or whether that's somebody who's black and uh, was was previously not welcome at the university. So that complexity that I experienced, which I got over very quickly, and people helped me, and just like we help, uh, we tend to help most of our colleagues, all of our colleagues, I hope. Uh, then that I got over that, but that was a sort of a nice sort of par parallel. Now, the in relation to the specific question about the about the, the policies in the university, I have to say I've, I've only had small, relatively small interactions with the ones around transformation and diversity. But what what Judge Campepi points to is sort of this labyrinthine sort of uh, le levels of different units and different policies, and you don't you don't know exactly who's in charge of of of, of, uh, of which thing. And so there's lot there's there's lots of there are processes that that need to that need to be followed. But it's rather complex. And it's rather complex as somebody new to the university, whatever your whatever your colour, and then it's rather complex if if I was actually making a, if I if I was subject to uh, harassment or, or an aggression and I needed to make a complaint, I wouldn't actually really always know wouldn't always know where to go. So it's not the people in the sense; it's the, it's the way they're put together in inside those uh, those, those sort of labyrinthine uh, labyrinthine policies. Now, I've also seen them in action where we where they've halted. Uh, Recruitment decisions, which were against transformation agenda, and and and, and people at lots of different levels will really really want to make a change, uh, but uh, but I've, but I've also seen the sort of there's so many different pa parallel pathways. It's not always it's, it's been possible to to, uh, to have different outcomes as well. In relation to my the rest to the solution, I I don't I I don't I, don't, I my off off the or sort of off the cuff type solution is, or is something that again that comes out to Campepe, who's a, a judge, not a management scholar. But she that she points to that there are, the university's made strong strong theoretical progress, progress whatever, whatever we might say that, that might be. But there is there's and there's there's progress or the, the evidence of leadership at the, at the top. But then points to a sort of a middle management, not a middle management problem, but it's managers of management of middle managers. I would say so. If people like me had in my KPIs, my, my performance indicators that I must promote certain culture change, I must promote certain levels of uh, recruitment, and, so, and, 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 and if I'm measured against that, then I would get on and do it. Just like if they said I need to make sure the lights are on 95% of the day, I would get on and do it because otherwise I'd be told off. So I think the, that, that's now, that, I don't want to reduce the transformation of Stenbosch University to, to a simple, K, simple performance indicators of individual managers, but I do think that, if the top of the university decided this was really what needed to happen, just like any organization, that then there would be, it would become part of our, our performance indicators at all levels. So we sort of decentralize the responsibility. It goes back to what I said before about everybody being responsible. And then I, then as man, managers at all different levels would be res, responsible for that. But I don't, it's not equally to blame middle managers because I don't, because it's actually the, the pro, again, the processes, because they're pulled in lots of different ways. But if this became a key strategic activity, that must be done, then, then, then I think we would all, all have to prioritize that. And just if I can just say about being a key strategic activity in relation to what Jonathan said about money going away, I think money, them, they, 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 they may, I, have no, I have no history and no, no, no knowledge of the sort of threats and whether the threats are empty or not, but I actually believe, maybe I'm an optimist, but there's also other money that will come. Um, this week, I had, con we were, had we, in the business school, we were talking to two different wealthy uh, financial institutions that want us to produce more black people that they can recruit. They, they want to transform. Now, so I, they, and they want to throw money at us, get, bring, give those, give the, help us get those, get those students. So I think there's other money that will replace that. Number two, I think the university, all universities, any, all, all over the world, uh, they, and all, all in academic institutions, sell, we, we sell or we promote an education. We also promote an identity. We want, we want people to be proud, and they are generally proud about leaving Stellenbosch University, going on to do other things. If that pride is then tinged with embarrassment because of something like Campepe or other incidents, then people go, mm, I don't want to be involved in that. And they start, so then, so I think there's, there's like a, almost like a business case that, that, that say, well, actually for the reputation of the university has to demonstrate, and the reputation of the business school as well, we need to demonstrate what we're doing because we want people to identify with us. We don't want to be an embarrassment. And I think one small anecdote, I don't have, I don't have such good anecdotes, Jonathan, but I was at, at Bry on, uh, on 
uh, the weekend, and somebody from a recruitment agency was looking, said we're recruiting, looking for a, a black programmers. And we, we, we list the university we go to, and they said, we, we don't bother with Stellenbosch. Because, not because there aren't black programmers at Stellenbosch, but because efficiency-wise, <laughs> you can go to another university and get a whole lot more for, your num for, your, for, your, for, the, for the one ca campus visit that you do. Now, that's also a kind of business case. If we're, if we're in the business of promoting the next generation of, of, of South African talent, then that's that we have to be fully engaged in rec recruiting and educating those people, but we also have to be fully engaged in having a reputation that clearly says we, we, we want to, pro to produce if you like, and, and promote and, and educate those people so they are uh, talent that's representative of, of South Africa, so that those recruiters come to us because that's part of our lifeblood. And then they go on to be passionate, proud in references of Stellenbosch University. We end up on a sort of virtuous circle. And if some of that money falls away, that's money we don't want. Yes, it's, you, you made it sound so easy. So the decision can be made right now. Um, Jonathan, uh, I'm going to open up to the floor. Um, just the translation of theoretical strides. Uh, is that yeah. not just another way of saying we talk a good game? Yeah, I think so. Um, look, I don't think... I don't think Judge Compeva got it completely right. I, I know what she's trying to say, the disjunction between policies, and we have amazing policies, and practice. She's correct. We need to bring those two things together. But that doesn't mean there hasn't been a major shift in many of the, um, the practices of the university. You know, when I came here five years ago, uh, just over five years ago, I mean, I would regularly, every day, walk through the building here, here, so the above, which I don't even know who the dude is, but um, I would hear a lot of Afrikaans. Today, you don't. Today, every lecture, unless it's an Afrikaans lecture or it's a suit or, a, you know, this is a little whatever, it's, it's, it's English. The place is changing, whether we like it or not. But I just want to say this, you know, apropos an important point that, that Bruce raised. I think it's also important not to expect the change only to come from the leadership of the university. We as black people undercut ourselves. Um, I remember I hired as a dean a whole lot of top black and white young scholars from around the world, particularly South Africans who wanted to come back. And one of those persons was Louis Ojita, who did amazing work uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, um, uh, on a very interesting area of learning. So I brought him to Pretoria. And one morning he comes into my office and he is furious. He is angry. I said, Lisa, what's wrong? No, I tried to park my car here on the education campus, Kruncliff. And this white woman, one of the secretaries, came to me and said, she didn't know who he was, you can't park here, you know? This is for so and so. I think he says to me, you must deal with that, JJ. I said, no, I'm not going to deal with that. I want to deal with you. You are a senior professor at this university. You allow a white woman to tell you where to park. You the fucking problem. <laughs> and so you must understand these are public institutions. They're not church schools. They're not Afrikaans institutions. They belong to all of us, including Afrikaans people. And therefore speaking out. Now I realize, I realize, that right now I can speak out perhaps more freely than you because, I mean, what are we going to do with me? Fire me, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, I have voice, I'm a professor, I've done a few things in my life, etc. But just so you know, I did these things when I was a high school teacher. I did these things when I was an ordinary, you know, academic. Uh, you have to understand that you are not a victim. The University of Cape Town's Vice Chancellor is not a bloody victim. You have power speak back where things are wrong and challenge your colleagues. What they can't do anything to you. If you on a matter of principle say, Mark, I really appreciate what you're doing in this business school, but this and this happened in financial transactions or whatever the cause might be. I have no question that Mark will hear you out. I have no question that he'll investigate. I mean, you with me? But too often I see at Stellenbosch, people are overwhelmed by the buildings. They're overwhelmed by you know, the weight of the professors, perhaps sometimes physically. Um, 
and they don't speak back. This is your university. And if I may quote the Bible, sister, you know, from the book of Exodus, own the land, occupy the land. Sorry, that's not a EFF. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting, Jonathan. Um, uh, you would know, uh, Mark would know that his ears probably burn from our engagements around that. But it's not always the case for all of my colleagues. In fact, it is still a struggle for many people to raise those issues, not for a lack of that they don't want to or they can't. I think it does take a bit of lived experience. You and I, like they say, are tired, no? we're tough. We've got uh, elephant hide. But we're able to stand on principle for, for many of these issues. It's not always the same for everyone. And so I do want to acknowledge that that's not always the case. And you're right. More of us need to do that more regularly, without fear of retribution. But I think that's the challenge, right? Without the fear of retribution, and then also without retribution. At this point, Colleagues, um, those online, um, I have uh, Jonathan's going to let me know if there's anything coming from that, or Janine, Janine, if there are any questions, but I have some younger people than me. I'm going to say younger because I've got a nice gray beard. I've it's been around for a while. Um, uh, so open to the colleagues. You've come, you've come to visit us, and we are waiting to hear your question. Yes, if you can just... Um, I think the mic will pick you up. Will the mic pick up? Yes, speak? if you can just give us your name. Um, and if you have a question to a specific panelist or general, no, you may sit. We don't have that formality. Okay. But we <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Pio Butle Kabaka. I'm the Secretary General of the SRC. Well, um, you know, I have a lot to say. So I'm going to try and keep it a bare minimum. But it's sad that the Mrs. Wuzi were experiencing what we were experiencing back then. And it, what you have said now is basically my reality. My first year in 2017 in this institution when it was supposedly better as people of color. Because I myself come from an Afrikaans school. I went to an Afrikaans school and saw no problem with being around white people. I never felt uncomfortable around white people. So the moment I landed in Stellenbosch, it was a reality there for me that actually in the Mazana, you are black. You know? So I don't know, a lot needs to happen in Stellenbosch and a lot of us don't speak much on it. And I just want to touch on what Prof. Janssen was saying that the majority of other institutions in South Africa, a residence is just a place to stay. But I believe it doesn't have to be. It's just that white people need to stop owning it and it needs to also be a part for us um, okay, white people need to stop owning it. We as black people can also enjoy those things. We as black people can also reflect on something and think to ourselves, this was actually a, a good place for me. Like now in my African school, I enjoyed myself there. I am proud to be an alumni of Table View High. So I think we also need to change that narrative a bit in these white historical institutions that it's not your home. You are coming here to study and you must be able to socialize with other people as well. So, I mean, another thing. Is okay. In our last rhetoric meeting, ma'am, we mentioned this thing of Stanford University that we are literally at the tipping point of our institution. And as you mentioned now, whether they like it or not, in the next five years or so, there's going to be more black people than white people in this institution. And my thing has always been for Stellenbosch is that they don't have anywhere to go. Why are we still begging them? So I, I, I even mentioned it at our last meeting, I think not a meeting, it was like a get together thing on Monday, that every time that we are gonna continue with this notion that we must beg the system, it's never gonna change. Why must you nurse other people's feelings when you are the one that's uncomfortable? So my thing is with Salomon University, they must demolish Africans, demolish that thing. Even if they must remove this cost, then it's fine. It must be Stellenbosch University. Remove all the other languages so that they can stop being so comfortable in this place because reality is they have nowhere else to go. They will not go anywhere else. Even if they try to influx um, porch, 
not all of them will be able to go there. So at the end of the day, that they will still have to go to Stellenbosch University. And like, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Like you said, if there's, there's lots of money in this world, if they want to take their money, it's fine. So as an institution, we need to now think and, and, and reassess that are we prepared and are we ready to lose however much that they are giving us or whatnot. So it's a thing, I mean, like this is just, yeah, we need to be clear on that and decide on that. Okay, as Noni, it's fine, we'll lose this money now, but we'll gain it out somewhere else. But personally, Africans must be demolished. That's why they are feeling comfortable, these people there. And that's why they're doing the things that they're doing to us, because I wish I can get to your place. Because my personal, I'm still very angry and I'm not a victim. And if you're gonna to come to me, I'm going to come for you as well. Yeah. Yeah, but, so I think, uh, our institution needs to create that space for us and we need our lecturers and all of those people to also support us in these things because as a Tina, black people in this SRC even, we are faced with a lot of problems. It's not that we don't want to be radical or don't know. You have to think, Ish, I must pass at the end of the day. They must get to a point where that we don't have to think about, am I going to fail or am I going to do this? Or am I going to do that? And in the report, Prof mentions must say that there needs to be an influx of black people, what, 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 what. And then the response is that um, the, 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 the system, the not the lower education, the high schools and the don't don't. It's not um, on, on standard, which I don't think is, is a reality. Why does VITS have so many black people? Why does UP so many have so many black people? It's not an issue of a, a supply of people of color. It's an issue that I don't want to go to Stellenbosch. Why am I going to go to Stellenbosch? So they, 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 they're allowing this behavior and they're continuing it. And what we have decided, we're not going to allow for that anymore. We're going to be honest with it. We're not going to romantize this nonsense. We're going to be clear and cut and open with it. So basically, yeah, the only thing that I comment, I guess, it's not really a question because I have very much to say about the institution is that we just need more support, even from our alumni, even from our other campuses, even from anyone else in G, just to, to acknowledge us that we are there, we are listening to you guys, and protect us from Mama Bolo because yay, uh -uh, they are traumatizing us, Shem. Uh, they are traumatizing us greatly. So, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, a lot is happening, but that's all I'm asking for. If something is happening there, you have an SRC now. We are not afraid to speak, and we are going to speak our truth. And the only way that this institution is going to actually transform is if they take radical steps. This EEE tiptoeing around each other, wanting the other one, okay, we are going to make this small change so that you can feel comfortable and make that small change so you can feel comfortable. It's not going to work for a very long time in Stambosh. It's going to come to a point where now we don't want to see the, way, the things that are going to happen there. Because as black people, we are over here, over here. And more and more and more people like me now are coming to the institution. Personally, I'm not, I'm not threatened by white people. I'm not threatened by anybody but myself. Yeah, well, so, yeah, thank you. Jonathan, just, just very quickly, um, a, a short maybe and Lucy response in terms of um, this notion again of learning, which obviously keeps surfacing. And you spoke to identity. Um, and you made reference to, to other universities. Uh, and I suppose we'll all agree there's a radicalism that is required. But what does that radicalism look like? Or what should it look like to take this university forward um, and avoid some of the pitfalls that our other uh, universities have encountered? Yeah, look, I, 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 I hear the students' uh, concern, and I think I hear the passion and uh, the frustration. That's real. Across generations, you're going to graduate one of these days, and other students will come in the same issues. But I do want to, if I may, uh, caution against uh, demolishing Afrikaans. The big, the big lie is that it's a white language. It's not a white language. In this province, it is a language that my ancestors helped to form, uh, the slaves up to form Afrikaans. And if you don't know that, it's important for you as students to learn the history of Afrikaans. What the white right has successfully done is to pretend that it's their language. My, ma my mother tongue, my mother's tongue was Afrikaans. We were raised in English, but my mother's tongue was Afrikaans. And I love speaking Afrikaans, but not the kind of Afrikaans you hearing, the kind of Afrikaans that is Khaselah, all my family in Lavender Hill, in Grassy Park, in Athlone, speak Afrikaans. You know, I'm the one that speaks English, and I mix between the two. 
Afrikaans was the language of Jake Scherbel, who led the transformation of the University of the Western Cape. So I think it's very important not to be hostile to Afrikaans, but to do what Judge Kampepe says, do it in a way that is not exclusionary. So if I come into my res and I see a whole lot of black people, I insist to speak Afrikaans when everybody there does. I've seen this a lot in Stellenbosch, in the Buert, in these public spaces. Then people have an attitude towards Afrikaans, which I get. But I do think it's important to also teach all of our students, both white and black, that the history of Afrikaans is not a white history. It is a history that many of our Malay families, for example, played a powerful role in shaping the language. None of that detracts from the fact that the way the language is used on campus gives you the kind of experience. In other words, it's not a chasalah Afrikaans. It's not Afrikaans that draws you in. It's Afrikaans that actually makes you demurred you know, because of ex exclusionary tendencies. I just want to mention something that I've mentioned many times in talks. I was in a line one day at in De Boert, which is a, a shopping area there in Salamash. And the guy next to me is a Shona speaker from Zimbabwe. And the colored woman, not the white woman, the colored cashier insisted that he speak Afrikaans, you know? And obviously I challenged that and told her where to get off. And that's the problem. It's not this kind of attitude towards Afrikaans. It's not just a white problem in Sarabash. It's also a conservative colored problem. And we need to say that to each other. Okay? So the question is, how do you use Afrikaans as a language that we can all enjoy? Okay? As opposed to a language that gets people angry because it cuts you out. It doesn't invite you in. What happened to Busi is unacceptable. And by the way, I made these arguments at the Free State for many years until Dutch students said to me, can we come? They were visiting the Free State, sat in classes, and they said to me, because um, I was pushing back, I said to the students, no, man, we must have Afrikaans and English and Sisutu as languages. And these Dutch students who had no dog in the fight came into my office, I'll never forget it. And they said, Professor, we want to tell you that we sit in the English classes and we sit in the Afrikaans classes because we can understand the Afrikaans as Dutch students. And we're telling you now that the black students in the English classes don't get half of the information. That was the day I went to my Senate and I said, that's it. We're only going to teach in English. Thanks, Jonathan. Lucy, um, there's a hand online, which I'm going to take, but I want you to reflect uh, um, just on the experience there. And I'm going to come back to you and ask you about what advice um, based on your experience and the wisdom you've gained, right, over the years that you would have for, 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 for our students. But on Marius, Marius um, welcome, and I see your hand is up, uh, your, if you want to give us your question. Or... Thank you very much. Um, a question and also a statement. Um, it was very interesting when I saw the events that happened in Stellenbosch. I'm a 1993 student, 1997 in Free State. Eventually, I moved up to Joburg. Then I'm now resident in Namibia. The weird part is when um, this incident happened, most of the time I laughed about it because in 1993, the same thing happened um, in Els Wichter. Um, when a student came in and he basically, he was so drunk and everybody of us were drunk. And he basically, um, what we called, he pissed in the guy's closet and we all laughed, um, which was a completely different reaction that was obviously, so social media obviously plays a vital role in how we um, interpret, um, how we assess something. And um, there was obviously conflict, but we handled the conflict and we put it through through the his father what we call in that period. And it was it was extremely good how we handled it. And once again, we were a minority also in Stellenbosch, but we never felt like a minority because our approach during that period as a black colored or whatever um, um, we are categorized now is we were reaching out to different cultures and not always um, assuming a culture should assimilate um, to what was or what isn't. So um, diversity and inclusion is it's, it's a both it's, it's, it's going both ways. It's a sharing, it's a finding, it is finding what polarizes, it, it, it is a finding of what assimilates us. It is finding something that is 
subgroups, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and there's a lot of um, variety and, um, and, and interest in the diversity subject. And that's weirdly a speciality of mine. I did my doctorate in, in, in diversity. And eventually um, I found a lot of things can be calculated. Um, emotions can be calculated and that is part of the diversity index that we get. And I think when I listen to this group and what is happening here, I'm actually afraid to go to Stellenbosch because mm -hmm. my 1993 experience and my 22, 2022 experience that I feel now is, is that you are completely polarized, <laughs> which is shocking because Stellenbosch was for us the place to be. Uh, mm -hmm. Majority white, we really didn't care. And, and, and I think Stellenbosch needs to find that essence where it should become the place to be. And, and, and that inclusion um, should, should, should go back, you know, when, when, when we say, if the acker falls on your head, you're truly from Stellenbosch. And me coming from the Cape Flats, we searched for that moment that made that beautiful. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love the conversation that is happening here, but there should be a much more deeper study and, and, and not only a qualitative study of interpreting things, but a hardcore quantitative study of what is happening there. What is our subgroups? What is our, our polarized groups? What is um, the distance? What is, what, what is really happening there? And there should be an active engagement or management system put into place to bring that vibe back that was Stellenbosch. And everywhere over the world that I go, I always brag about Stellenbosch. So this, so this incident is something that's extremely shocking for me and how it's interpreted, but I would love to read the report. My question to the professor, from an educational management perspective, what will be your greatest step if you have to select from your head, from, from the top of your head, the best? S3 approaches that we can make Stellenbosch great again um, post this incident and actually for a change have that respect for diversity and make the campus actually safe for diversity. That is my question. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Um, I'm going to actually, Lucy, if you don't mind, I'm going to hold you because there's some engagement with the students that I think we, we're going to come back to. Um, Jonathan, Mark, that question, if we can pose it to you both, um, if you can take that from a, a broader institutional perspective, what your thoughts are, and Mark, maybe apply it to the business school. And then I'm coming to my student colleagues um, on that side, um, Lucy, for a further engagement. Hi. I actually don't know how to make sense of Marius at all. Mm. That he could find pissing in a residence, something funny, is despicable. You know, um, uh, this is not funny. Secondly, he's obviously speaking from a, a colored point of view as a student who could speak Afrikaans. But then I see this problem from the point of view of people who can't speak Afrikaans, not because they lack intelligence, but because there are other languages in this fucking country. So I don't understand what Marius is saying. I find it objectionable what he's saying, to be honest with you. Uh, this university is not for one kind of person. It is for all of us. And especially, you know, fundamental, talking about religion, fundamental to all of our faiths, all of our faiths is taking care of and giving regard to the person who is least, who is least recognized, who is least resourced, and so on. You don't boast about we laughed at a kid pissing up in a race. That is offensive. But the inability of Marius to understand that there are other people on our campus, you know, for whom who have the same rights to enjoy access to an education in a language that they can understand and appreciate that he doesn't get that, I don't understand. Uh, Marius's question is, what is the one thing that you do? I don't think there's one thing. I think there's 10 things. I've written a book about the 10 things that you can do. The core curriculum is one of those things, but on its own, Bruce is correct, it won't shift things. Talking to people at every level of the university is an important thing. I've said to the senior management of this university when they called me, I was in California for a conference, and they called me up and said, um, you know, help us. 
as a senior management makes sense of Jens de Toy, I said it's very simple. Your messaging system doesn't talk about racism. You've got orientation, you've got graduation, you've got welcoming ceremonies, you've got alumni meetings. I've heard you guys talk about big data. I've heard you talk about climate change. I've heard you talk about every interesting thing except racism. So it turns the toy has never been confronted, okay, with, uh, with a university leadership that says, we just want you to know in this place, if you come in, racism is wrong and we will come after you. Sexism is wrong. Xenophobia is wrong. Leadership's role is to have a messaging system across, but that messaging system can't just be words. If five years from now, let me put my friend Mark on the spot. If five years from now, I come into the business school and I don't see very senior black professors, and by black, I mean all of us, in addition to white colleagues who are professors in this, then he would have failed in his task. Yes, he might have brought in billions. Yes, he might have done that, but then he's not in South Africa. You with me? And so the messaging system is important, but the action that followed, this is what Judge Kampepe is saying. Where are the deeds, not just the words? And I don't think at Stellenbosch, not just Stellenbosch, most of our universities, that there is a consistent systematic approach to transformation. We only have these discussions when there's a crisis. Yeah, and interestingly, in the report, um, Judge Kampepe mentions the inability of the, as Mari says, the, his father, the, the heads of those residents to actually manage and deal with these types of situations. So it is wonderful, uh, very different to my, 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 my experience as a, as a younger student, um, you know, coming into this university uh, and moving through it. Uh, Mark, just coming off there, uh, a quick so, response and then quick, quick, so quick response. Um, so as a, new, as a novice South African, I don't, I, I don't think I can com comment on the, the previous experiences at, at Stellenbosch. I just said one, one thing, the, the sort of formulation makes Stellenbosch great again, it sounds a bit like Donald Trump, but it's a, but, but Stellenbosch is, is a sort of great place to come. And we, we, have, we have many black students, we have, we're, we're more, we have many more black students than white students here in, in the business school. And people come here, even though they might have heard their work, the, the stories that they've, they've heard, they, they come because, because of the great reputation in terms of the, the, the academics and, and, and the, the connections to industry and the job prospects and, and, and the rest of it, as well as living in the beautiful Western Cape. So it's great despite some of the challenges which we, 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 we face, but not, not at all to, to negate what the, the, the experience we've had, but it is, it's, it's, still a, it's still a great place to come. We, we, sh we need to move beyond that. One thing I would do in answer to Marius' questions, I can answer. Well, yesterday we had a session, we had an internal session when we talked about this in, in, among, us, among our staff. And one of the things that somebody wrote down, I don't know who wrote this down, but we wrote it down on a piece of, a piece of paper. Uh, they wrote down the Elvis, Elvis quote uh, the, from the Elvis song, a little, bit less, a little bit less conversation, a little more action. And that's the one thing I think we need. We need a plan. And, and we, for the business school, we will have a plan. And we will, we're going to do that on the 7th of December. And then the start of January, we will present that plan to our colleagues and our students. And we will ask them what they think. And then we will get on and do. And we will make mistakes. We'll get some things wrong. But we will be committed to, to doing. So we're, 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 we'll be in that of the, of the practical to complement the theoretical. Thanks, Mark. I think, you know, like one of my, um, I say student colleagues, right, because we, we work with postgraduate students, is here are my notes. Um, and I think we may need many more contribution of those notes to assist uh, you and the leadership in taking this issue forward. Uh, the young person with the black top on first, then we're going to move quickly. If I can ask you to just keep your question, is a question uh, to the Okay, good, because then I'm, uh, Busi, I think there's a lovely interaction between you and the students, so I'm going to ask them in some ways just to uh, reflection. Do we have a reflection or a question? Is it a question and a comment? A question, comment, and then the young comment, question. Okay, so if you can keep it uh, crisp, um, and then we can have all three, and then uh, Busi, I think we're going to, to, to hand over to you. One, two, three. Um, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Charmaine Lowe. I told you I'd saying that surname. 
Um, I am a cluster convener for one of the clusters, uh, Validus, to be specific. Um, first of all, the first point is this so-called triple BEE. I don't understand how businesses such as Stellenbosch University uses codes to determine how um, inclusive they are by measuring how many black employees in executive positions, how many black employees in middle and lower class management. I think it should be eradicated because now it seems like it's no longer about the qualities and the experience that the person brings to the table. It's more of, oh yeah, no, she's black. Let's employ her to look good in the Employment Equity Act and in the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, second point is the personal experience with the surname Low. I come from Joburg where racism, it's not really like a thing. Um, coming here, Stellenbosch University was, or still is my dream university. I was very excited getting an acceptance letter. My family was excited, packed my bags, came here. And the first question or a comment from a welcoming leader was, your surname is Low. I was like, yes. And that marked a beginning of an identity crisis where I'm like, okay, most people who have the, sur the same surname as me, they are white. How come I can't have the same name? Because people will assume that I'm white. It happens in a clinic. I went to a clinic recently and the pharmacist was like, speaking of it once because she saw the surname. And I was like, no, English, please. And she's like, oh, okay, sorry. It just, it's so frustrating where I have to constantly sort of try to explain myself that no, my surname is low, but I prefer to be spoken like using English. So it, it's very frustrating to kind of like, hey, my surname is low, but please speak English to me. And sorry, another one, uh, a friend of mine from first year actually failed a module because the building was in Afrikaans and she did not understand where it was or the translation of that building. So she actually had to repeat a module because she couldn't find the venue at all. And it's so saddening that she has the capability of passing the module, but she just didn't know where it is. So. Just, just go ahead, yes. Uh, to the, um, keep it nice and brief, we're almost heading out of time. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Queen Machikichela. I am the Treasurer General of the SRC. Um, so, Mark, you spoke about um, voice and how people should speak up for themselves. Um, Professor Janssen, you reiterated that point as well. Um, my question and comment is also that the university um, doesn't allow for even people that work in their spaces, whether it be academic staff, cleaning staff, to have a voice. Because how come that it would be that other, at other institutions or it, at an institution, just a normal institution, doesn't matter whether it's academic or not, people are allowed to join worker unions, but in the space that we are, that is not something that's, you know, that is allowing for, for people to, to join. We'd find that there's academic staff, academic staff, you know, that's being ill-treated and there's no, no persons or people to represent them because the, the institution itself is not welcoming, you know, to worker unions to represent. So there's no representation for academic staff, admin staff, cleaning staff at the institution. Another problem that we face at our institution, and it's something that I've experienced myself as a student activist, is that, yes, we do have the vocal folks um, in the institution, but once the institution sees that, oh, no, this one is too vocal, she's going to radicalize, or he's going to radicalize the rest of the student community, they try by all means to victimize you. I, myself, being a person that led the racism protest, during the racism protest, the university went as far as to hiring private security to follow me around. So for us as, as, as student activists or as students to voice our, our, our issues and our problems that we face in the institution is very difficult because if not, if you're not going to be victimized like in the security type of way, the university is going to call you behind closed doors in chambers, offer you a certain types of money, or offer you, yeah, here's a person you're going to study overseas because they're scared once you open your mouth, you're going to radic radicalize the rest of the student community. So how do we voice ourselves in an institution where there's no representation for workers and for student leaders? 
we'll take the last comment and then oh, is, is that a question or a comment? Uh, greetings everybody uh, my name is prince general elect member of the soc i feel like it, the problem lies here in this room whereby there's a few of us here and two of people of color in the panelists whereby uh, we govern by the society of like the majority being the major the minority being the majority and the majority being the minority which is something that most of us are afraid to to face like the real issue at hand that racism is something that like everybody or everyone like uh actually inherit from the parents. you cannot run away from the fact that like racism is somebody like is like looking at the, at the racist like, the incident like that happened in the east Maury, that it's something that is in there within the vein, within there somebody's like a trace, but now it unleashed easily when there's alcohol consumed within the body. I, I have actually a problem now where every time we have to sit, we have to talk about a, our experiences as a black, uh, as a people of color. It, it's, it's very shameful and actually it, it's, it's targeting actually what your minds, I feel like it's targeting like what are the mindset of the black masses think at the current moment? As if like there should be a strategy that has, should be built towards like our own cognitive thinking at the current space and the current time. I think it's very problematic that like, even now there are no like more of the white people within the house, but they, you will see tomorrow or the other day after the news speaking something else like uh, this and this and this and that, but they were not here at the actual uh, our conversation. I would like to 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 to, uh, to call to uh, Mr. Mark there when he is saying that um, he's speaking on behalf of the business school. Uh, that thing really hurt me too is the fact that like we are young and you all, most of people here in the business school are old people. It, it's really interesting to listen to your perspective. Now this thing of racism is a plague society to the young. What actually the, 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 the others are saying to us that, why should us, we have to sweat, why the others know the real truth, where we should, we should actually take place, where we should actually, speaking of those things like outly. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fine. Okay. So, uh, um, and to the rest, I don't know if there was anything that anybody wanted to respond to. Um, uh, I would like for Busisiwe to have the last word. Um, so, Jonathan, is there, if you, if, okay. okay. So, if Mark, if you just can have a, there, there was, there, there were three comments around um, identity, uh, voice. Uh, and then racism being in your veins, and there was uh, a question that was directed. Is it true that the university doesn't have unions? Yes. yes. Oh, right. There are unions, but majority of the time they told that they're not allowed to yeah. operate on university spaces. So, for example, um, ITAO, it's a new uni union that was established by um, um, the cleaning staff at the institution, and they were told that you want to have meetings with the employees, you guys have to go in, to go to SPUR and have the meeting at SPUR and not okay. at the university premises. I am very surprised, but I will follow up on that. Okay. The democracy you must have unions. I'd not like them, but you could have. So Mark, uh, just the, the, there was a question towards you and then Brucey, I'm going to give you, if I don't see any hands online, I'm going to give you the fire tool and uh, I know it's going to be the most profound words and no pressure there. Uh, um, I just say in in reverse order. So um, I didn't intend to when I said I speak for the, the business school. I was trying. I was wanting to make a distinction. I, I'm not a spokesperson for the university. We, we, um, I'm because of the, the job I do. But so I speak from. I speak on behalf of the business school. I speak on behalf of myself as a as a citizen of a citizen of the university and somebody who, as I said right at the top, about who's as dismayed and, and embarrassed about the and, and saddened by by everything, by the things you read in uh, one reads in Camp Pepe. Just the second thing I want to say about voice is that I agree with what Jonathan said about that people should people should speak up, but I think we should also recognise in Camp Pepe that people. I think it's great. So the point the point that you made that people, that people feel scared to speak up. So I think it's important for people like me and 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 other act, uh, other other leaders to provide to provide a space for people to speak up. It's a very small thing, but we we've we've made the, like a anonymous places where not you can post anonymous comments. So then you then people can speak freely and then we, we then I answer those in a public way, but then it doesn't I don't know where it's come from. So it, but that's a small thing, but I think that 
and that then creates a, a role of uh, the snowball of create, creating a, a safe space. And the last thing I wanted to point, say was something Jonathan said to me earlier about us preaching to the choir. I think the problem here, we're, 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 we're in a room and I'm, I'm maybe the only white guy here, I'm not sure. Uh, and two, there's two, sorry, two or three other people who are white, and I think that's, that's a problem. That's, that's, a, that's a problem for, for tonight, but it's not a problem for, but it's, a, it's something then you go to, okay, so when do we create the next space where we can have that conversation? And yesterday I had, had a room where we were half half. And so I think it's important to be deliberate about those, those decisions and keep, and, keep, and keep pushing that. But I don't underest, under, underestimate that, uh, that need to create a voice, but create, and create a voice that's, that's safe for some. Some people are courageous like Jonathan. Some people and some people need a bit, bit more encouragement, or they're more scarred, uh, uh, and they need they need to be develop their trust in the in the institution that they can speak up. Using myself the last word, uh, yeah. and so I, I just want to say one more thing. Um, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> and because I've lived through this so many times, so many lives, um, I think it's also important for us as black people not to create the conditions that make white people scared to come into the room. You must understand that. Because if I'm going to come into the room and feel I'm going to be insulted, and then I'm going to come. So it is important also to ask, um, how do we, how does Mark, how do I, how does the dean create spaces? Because if we just talk to ourselves, we're going to go nowhere, all right? Now, now sometimes you can have a captive audience, like at the Senate, and say, we're going to talk here because you all are here. But I don't see that happening much. But in the informal spaces like today, I think it's really important to have those white uh, young students in the reses who have management positions to come here. But you have to, we created those forums and said, this is a safe space. You're going to talk honestly to each other. But unless you create that, because it's so easy for us to talk to each other and say, I'm having this problem and having that problem. But unless you can systematically and sympathetically take the other side with you, remember, as I said to the Vice Chancellor of the University in Trouble, when you lead your university, you're not leading black people, you're leading all of our people. And that also applies to this forum. Shall I hear the words? Yes, there's, uh, just to refresh on those three things, there was the issue around identity, voice and racism being in our veins. Uh, but I previously asked you, what is the sage advice you can give uh, to those that are following us. Sure. So I'll start with, hello, All right. So your question was, how, how did I get here? Because you acknowledge that at this point in time, you're angry, right? And you, you don't understand how potentially one day you'd be able maybe to have this kind of discussion and not feel the way that you do. So first of all, I want to say, I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through. And at the point in time that I was also maybe your age and going through the same, I was also angry and it was painful. And it's important for you to be able to acknowledge that it's okay to feel hurt. You know, don't feel embarrassed about the fact that it hurts. It hurts, it hurts, and that's perfectly fine. What you can do about it is to decide either this experience, this journey of walking through this lovely institution, because I respect it as an academic institution. There's the other side, but let's talk about the academic story. You applied to the university, right? Because you respected the level of education that you would acquire from being at the University of Stellenbosch. That is a big accomplishment, right? You're going to walk this academic journey you're going to do exactly what you thought you would do when you applied, and you're going to graduate. That's one decision that I think you should make today. Secondly, it's important for you to know that if you choose to be broken by this experience, you'll be a broken individual, and broken people cannot heal. Broken people cannot rebuild. Do you want to rebuild the nation? I'm sure you do. Do you want to rebuild the society or community that you come from? I'm sure you do. If you choose to be broken, to be angry, to be bitter, to hate African-speaking individuals or white people, you won't attain that. So make that decision. The next point that you made 
It was on the area of, of culture and inclusivity. And I think all of you also touched on it. We have to face the fact that there is a mismatch between the culture on paper that the university portrays, because according to the restitution statement of the university, I will read it at the end. In responsibility toward the present and future generations, SU commits itself unconditionally to the ideal of an inclusive world-class university in and for Africa. Now I have two issues with this statement. One, unconditionally. Unconditionally means without compromise, without if or but. So now it brings me back to what the students are crying about and you're crying about the issue of language. I agree with Prof. Let us not be angry about Afrikaans as a language. Let us embrace the history of South Africa. That's perfectly fine. However, I am of the opinion that any language, whether my language or anybody else's language, I am of the opinion that it should remain where at home, right? We all have a, a heritage, a belonging, a tribe, right? But if this is really a public institution, there should be no preference towards one language over the others, because that says to me one thing. If we are saying, let us preserve the Afrikaans language as a mode of instruction, it says to me that that language and the people who own it, or maybe incorrectly so as Prof has corrected us, they are way, they are higher up, they are better up, they are more preferred, and that is the problem. It then creates um, this, this exacerbation of, of inequality. And what I'm saying is the anger, let's let go of the anger, but let's speak fact. There is no reason why we should not all speak English at a university. And if Stellenbosch University is speaking the truth by claiming to be a university that is world-class, then we know what world-class means. And it's not Afrikaans, it's not Sesotho, it's not Xhosa, it's English. So I agree with you on that basis. The next question was about bullying and intimidation. There was a point that was raised that people, whether it be students or academic staff or workers, are not able to speak up. And I find it a pity that that is what I experienced then and that is what you are still experiencing today. I've always been vocal, but when I arrived at the university, I was told by my seniors who were black and they said, if you want to complete this degree of yours, close that mouth, keep quiet, stick to your corner, stick to your place, do what you need to do, and don't complain. Don't come here with your black toy toy things, don't do that. So I understood that, and I kept quiet for six years. The fact that you're still experiencing that today, and according to Judge Khan Pepe's report, senior members of staff of the university are also feeling intimidated they're not able to speak up. It says we still have a problem. We still have a problem. Not everybody's going to speak up. I'm speaking up because I'm safer in the business school. If I was at Tigerberg Hospital, I was not going to set foot here. If I had chosen to specialize and I was training through Tigerberg, do you think I'd be sitting here? I would never have sabotaged myself to that extent. We still have a problem. The next point you made was about numbers. It's unfortunate that black people are accepted on a basis of chasing numbers to satisfy the quota. But you know what? I was a member of the Chesok program where they took a few of us black students and incorporated us into this program and gave us the opportunity to study, right? So I went there, yes, I did academic, I performed academically well but also because I'm black. But you must learn to use the things that people give to you to ridicule you, to benefit you, because here I am sitting with my MBCHB. Look, whether or not I went in there because I was black, the point of the matter is it's mine, and I'm here again now sitting for an MBA. So don't let that put you to shame, right? Learn to do what? 
to turn the story around, to benefit you, to build you, that you can also stand and be a voice for the younger generation. The next point, the gentleman brought up that we need to understand that this issue is bigger than university level. And I'm so with that because what I think that we don't understand is that black people feel unsafe in the presence of white Afrikaans people. And white Afrikaans people have also begun to feel unsafe in our presence. And that's why they're not here because we're most likely, according to them, going to point fingers and play the blame game. And that is wrong. That is not what is going to get us to move forward as society and as a nation. The things of the past have happened. Yes, people have been hurt. Lives have been lost. Livelihoods have been lost. But look at this. We have an option. Do we continue to sit and call each other, you people, you people? Or do we come to a common place where we look at each other as equals? where we look at each other and practice the principle of Ubuntu, where we respect humanity, that I am and so are you, and there is no human who is better than the other. Because until we come out of this little circle of this battle at the level of Stellenbosch University, we're missing what's happening at the macro level, right? Because if I don't feel safe around a white person and a white person doesn't feel safe around me, in the university. That also extends into the broader society. And look at what's happening at the national level. Look at what is happening with the leadership of the country. If we stick to these corners like we currently have been, it means that we will vote based on color, that I will vote for a black man or a black party based on the color and not based on merit and ability to lead the nation out of bondage captivity. Is that correct? If I were to look at my white brother and see him as a human being, as a brethren, I would not feel threatened by him. That means when it's time to choose leadership for the country, I would actually start to vote based on merit, based on which men and women are able to lead this country out of the broken state that we're in. This problem is big. It is beyond the University of Stellenbosch. If we don't put our egos down and get over this drama of melanin, it's only pigment, that's it. The difference between Mark and Busi is pigment. My heart sits in the fifth intercostal space. So does his, right? He has two lungs and so do I. There is nothing different. If we don't come out of this, we're going to miss an opportunity to do something like standing together and acting together to bring a change in this country. Thank you. On that note, Reverend. I, I just want to yes. say, if, if, I want to say if, if Busi did an altar call now, I'd come forward. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 but on a serious note, um, it's also about what we share. And I don't know if Busi and Mark know this, talking about languages, but they probably can speak to each other in French. Mm -hmm. They're just also looking for those things that connect us. But great. Yes, so the call there, Busi, and I think again, um, if you didn't know why you were here, it was to deliver those powerful notes. Uh, and, and from our side, I want to appreciate that and acknowledge that. Um, it leaves me with the pleasure of saying thank you to all of those of you who've joined us online and have managed to stay there and engage with us. Um, to the students, I'm, I'm immensely grateful for the fact that you've made the trip here. Um, and I really appreciate that you've come to engage with us. Uh, to those of you in the audience, our colleagues that work here, thank you very much. Uh, to the cameramen, the soundmen, um, and then to the Thank you for making sure that all of this um, could go as smoothly as it has. And lastly, Jonathan Busi, Mark, uh, thank you for engaging with us. And I wish you all a safe trip home.